Grab your Bibles. Um, we're going to pray, then we're going to go into the Word. Today I am on the back end of the Identity Series. So I just want to share with you just a couple of things, um, two simple things I really want to encourage you um, with this morning, prayerfully. I won't be before you too long, but my objective today is just to kind of talk about what this all means. We've been talking about this for quite some time. And once again, um, I just want to encourage you at a completely different place to let God be God in our midst. So bow your heads with me. We're going to pray, and then we're going to go to God's word to allow God to speak to us. Father, in the name of Jesus, open our hearts to hear. Open our hearts to receive, Lord. We love you this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the fact that we are made in your image and in your likeness. So as I stand to say your word again, remove Felix out of the way. Felix has nothing to say unless you speak, God. So we want to hear from you clearly. We want to hear from you plainly, Lord. So speak um, as we give you praise, honor, and glory. Uh, we thank you for what you're doing. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Throughout the, throughout the entirety of this series, we've been talking about this whole issue of the fact that as an image bearer, God's design for me is that I become like him and I represent him in the earth. Come on, repeat after me. Say, as an image bearer, God's design for me is that I become like him and that I represent him in the earth. Uh, amen. So I want to talk today just briefly about what does all this mean? What are some of the implications? And I just want to share two simple things with you from the book of 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. So if you can go there with me, um, I want to point uh, just two simple things out in the text that I believe has some great implications for us as people of God as we kind of walk through uh, this passage this morning. So 1 John chapter 3. And while you're going there, let me just kind of say this by way of introduction before I even read um, what the text says. I don't know if you realize this or not, but God's goal is that he is a long-suffering God. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And let me tell you what that means. As image bearers, and when I say image bearers, I don't want you just to restrict the statement just simply to people that have given their life to God, but people in general were all made in the image of God. And because of the fact that we're made or the truth that we're made in the image of God, you need to hear me say that when men sin and man fall, mankind sin and they fail in the book of Genesis, God's goal, God's intent was to redeem man and to bring man back into a relationship with him. His goal is never severed relationship. His goal is never the fact that we are apart from him, but he wants to bring us back into relationship with him. If you're wondering how all this fits and how all this works together, if you were to retract with me in the Old Testament, here's what you will find in the Old Testament. God wanted to maintain that theme throughout the entirety of history. So what does he do? He, cho he chooses Abraham, and he chooses Abraham's descendants, and he says to Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to multiply your seed. I'm going to make your descendants as numerable as the sand of the sea. Now, you might be asking, why would God do something like that? Why would God choose this one people group or this one nation, namely the nation of Israel, to do what he did. Here's what you need to know that you may not have already known. And if you've been here any length of time, you've heard me say this. God's intent for choosing the Israelites, not only were they to be the vehicle through which his child would enter the earth, but his intent was to select a group of people that he would love up on, that he would show them how much he cared, that he would show them that he is a loving God, he's a merciful God, he's a just God, he's a kind God, such that all the other pagan individuals of the world that were not worshiping him would see this people group and notice how much their God cared for them such that they would become jealous of the relationship they had with their God and they would want to enter into a relationship with him. That's his intent. That's his, in, his design. Now, you need to know that that transferred all the way through the New Testament because his promise was, not only am I going to love these 
these people, namely the children of Israel, these are my own chosen people, but I'm going to send my son through them. And when my son enters the world, his goal then was to make this relationship available to the world in its entirety. So here's what you find in the book of John chapter 1 around verse 11. It says, he came unto his own. And his own received him not, but as many as receive him, listen to what I'm going to say, to them he gave power to become sons and daughters of God, even to them who believe on his name. Now, what excites me about what that verse says is, is because of what God did, because of God's intent, because of God's design, as an image bearer now, I have access to God. Oh, come on, I need, I need, I need, I need a couple more amen in that. That's good news. That's, turn to your friend and say, friend, you have access to God. Come on, tell him again. Say, friend, you have access to God. So I want to read this passage, and I want to share two simple truths with you from this passage. So look with me at 1 John chapter 3, and then jump down to verses 1 through three, that's all I want to read. And I just want to be, I'm going to be very simple, very short, just to point out some things to you. If you're there, say amen. amen. Notice what the text says. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not, does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children. Now that we will be, I mean, now what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, hallelujah, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. How? As he is pure. Now, there's, there's, there's two things, two truths that I want to point out from, for you in the passage. And the first one I want you all to take away if you're wondering what's the implication of the fact that I have my identity and I know God. Here's what I want you to lock into number one. As an image bearer, our identity, and notice the word that I'm using, should be in Christ. Amen? I need everybody to repeat this. Repeat it. Say, self, my identity should be in Christ. One more time. Self, my identity should be in Christ. Now, you're probably wondering what does that mean, right? We want to walk through this to kind of give you a feel. Let me do a little bit of work in the text. Notice what verse 1 says. See what kind of love the Father has given us. Some of your translation, depending on which version you have, might say bestowed on us. Here's what you need to know that's kind of nuanced in the verb when it says the Father has given us this kind of love. That, that word given there that's used there, it's, it's kind of written in a tense, a perfect tense, that says this, that God did not wait until I got it together for him to start loving me. <laughs> you got to get, yeah, yeah. Remember, remember, and, and I just, I can't help myself, but I have to go back to how I introduced the sermon. When I started the series with you several weeks ago, here's what I said. I am learning how to love. I did say that. Are you with me? I'm learning how to love. And the reason I said that statement at the onset of the series was the fact that the truth existed. If you wronged me, I didn't love you the way God loved you. Or don't look at me like I'm funny because you did the same thing with others in your life, right? But then when I got to this verse and I, re I realized the implication of my identity, the perfect tense says, before I even came on the earth, God already loved me. Y'all not hearing me. Come on now. And, and, and the fact exists that present tense today, he still loves me. Come on. And, and future tense, he will continue to love me. Y'all gotta, yeah, gotta get this. Yeah. Because there's a lot of implications associated with that. Because here's what that means. Here's how I said it. He did not wait until I got it right for him to start loving me. Matter of fact, Romans 5 and 8 puts some context on it. It says, while I was yet sinning, he still what? Yeah, and then he loved me so much that he died for me. John goes on to say, greater love had no man than this, that a man laid down his life for a friend. Now, I appreciate that because here's what that means. If while I was still shucking and jiving, God loved me, why do I think that if I mess up now that I have a relationship with him, that his love for me is going to stop? 
Yeah, and I want the church to get this. I want the church to get this because here's some implication. As image bearers, if we're going to be like God, we are obligated to love like God. Oh, you got to get this. Y'all don't want to hear this part. We're obligated to love like God. And here's what that means. You don't have to wait until people come into a relationship with God to start loving them. You've got to love them right now in their mess, even though they don't know God, because that's what God did. He loves them so, and I like that because here's what I'm learning to love. Folk that don't look like me, I've got to love. Come on. Folk that don't behave like me, I've got to love. Folk that don't talk like me, I've got to love. Folk that don't choose the same lifestyle that I've chosen, I've got to love. Come on. Folk, oh, y'all not. Y'all not hearing me. And the problem with the church, we are image bearers. We name the name of God, but we don't know how to love like God. The text opens up. John says, greater love, look look what the text says. See what manner, what kind of love it says that the Father has given to us. And then look at the text. Then the next phrase says that we should be called sons of God. I've got to do a parenthetic there. Because the we speaks to the world. The should speaks to whether you've made the decision or not. (laughs) Yeah, they kind of call that the subjunctive, right? That's the move of probability or possibility. So here's this: what this means. Everyone has an opportunity to be called a child of God. Some of us have not yet made the choice. So, so listen to this. I like this. Because God loves the world, I got to set this straight. It doesn't mean the world is going to heaven by default. Right? There's choice. And we should be says that the only way you'll be called a son or a daughter or a child of God is if we have accepted Christ in our life as personal Lord and Savior. So just like I did last week, moving forward in the text, I'm not talking to unsafe folk, though we're going to give you an opportunity to accept Christ if you're watching online or you're listening somewhere, but I'm talking to those who name the name of God. What are some of the implications now of this identity? Is this making sense? And, and one good thing that I really like about it is this, that we should be called children of God. And don't miss the phrase, come on, say, of God. Say, of God. Here's what that means. It's a genitive of possession that means what? That I am a child belonging to God. You got to get this. I don't belong to the world anymore, but God has ownership of me. Come on, repeat after yourself. Say, self. God has ownership of me. That's good news, y'all. Come on again. Say, self. God has ownership of me. Now hear this. Stop the lie that the devil is on your back. The devil is chasing you. If you are a child of God, the enemy don't have access because you belong to God. Come on, let's get our theology right. Get it right, get it right, get it right, get it right, get it right. Beloved, he says that we should be called children of God. And look at this. And the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not want no him. So don't, don't expect, don't expect, and let me kind of move through this. Don't expect the world will recognize who you are because they didn't recognize who God is. But my, my point is, and so because they don't recognize who you are, guess what they're going to try to do? They're going to attach worldly labels to image bearers that God has that are identified as children of God. And I want us to get to the place where we reject those labels and don't make the mistake of bringing them into the family of God. Come on, does that make sense? So look at this. So what are the benefits of being identified with Christ? I like this. Number one, this is if I don't say nothing else, I can stop right here. I am, well, let me let me don't steal it all for myself. You are joint heirs with Christ. Oh, come on, say amen. Come on, come on, one time. Say, you are joint heirs with Christ. Very, 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 very important. And I'll talk about what that means, right? So, so, so here, here's what joint heirship means. And go, well, let me just jump here. Go to Romans, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Y'all go there really, really quick. Come on, jump there really fast. Romans, 
Romans chapter 8, and jump down to verse 12. I just want to read this one. Romans 8 and 12. This is just so good. Come on, if you're there, say amen. Notice what it says in Romans 8 and 12. So then, brothers or sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are, what's that word? Sons, and let me add daughters, just to see that in the neutral gender, sons or daughters of God. Watch this. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of what? Adoption as son by sons, by whom we can say, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are, I love this, children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The best illustration I can give you to help amplify this point is my summer. This summer, I had all my grandkids with me. Amen. Thank you for praying for me. Amen. Here's what these little boogers did. I have a 10-year-old, I have a 7-year-old, I have a 3, a three well, she's 4 now, and then I have a 8 months. And I had all of them in my house. What was exciting about these guys is that um, the, the, the first three lives all the way in Maryland, and the only way we communicate is, what's that, that FaceTime thing? You kind of get what I'm saying, FaceTime thing. But, but they know who Grandpa is. Come on, does this make sense? And here's, here's the depth of what this. They got off that airplane, and I forgot, I think it was Eddie or somebody who picked them up because I was home fasting and praying for the month so I can kind of <laughs> persevere. <laughs> yeah. and, and, but, but here's the point that I want you to see. The moment that car pulled up in the driveway, all four of those little guys jumped out the car. And I was in my bedroom on my face, Lord Jesus, you got to give me strength. You got to help me make it. You got to whatever. And, and here's the thing that I want you to see. All four of them came to the front door. They didn't stop to ring the doorbell. I mean, matter of fact, they had codes. They sure did. They had a code to the house. And I'm like, oh, my mama gave me the code, they said. They had a code. And they came, all I heard was kids running upstairs. And then next thing I know, my bedroom door bust open. And all four of them jumped in. And they just jumped in the bedroom on top. Bam! Grandpa! Here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. They didn't have to stop at the bedroom door and knock. Y'all didn't hear me. They didn't have to stop at the front door and ring the doorbell. Y'all not hear me. Come on, y'all. And the reason they can do all that, because they know me to be grandpa and lock into this as grandchildren, they knew they had access. I wish I had somebody, yeah. Yeah, they, matter of fact, they had so much access, they were in the garage naming which car going to be theirs. Hey, come on. They were in the refrigerator. They had their own remote control. They had access. They came from Maryland to Denver, and each one had a shopping list. Y'all not hearing me. Come on. They had access because they came prepared because they knew for 45 days they were going to be hanging out with Grandpa. People, that's what airship means. And that's what sonship means. You got to get this. That if God is my daddy, I've got access. Y'all not hearing me. If God is your daddy, you've got access. And we need to understand what access is because a lot of us don't know that and we want to approach God. But here we are because we don't know who we are. We're standing at the door knocking when all you got to do is go in. I wish I had somebody in here. We don't know what belongs to us. Come on, say access. Say it again, say access. That's what airship means. Here's what these little boogers are doing. They're waiting for me to die so they can claim what's coming to them. We had some serious conversations, y'all. Y'all not, you, you think I'm joking. Serious conversations. Because they know. 
I mean, they even talked about insurance plans. And I'm like, how, how old? But they knew they were heirs. You kind of get where I'm going? And they were excited about their inheritance. And as believers in Christ, we don't live life like that. We don't know that we're heirs. Matter of fact, the Bible puts it this way, joint heirs with Christ. Here's what that means. Whatever the Son, Jesus the Son has, I have access to because God is my daddy. Oh, hallelujah. Listen to what it says. Sonship guarantees that I have access to the Father, right? Sonship guarantees that I've got protection from, y'all not hear me, y'all not hear me, y'all not hear me, y'all not hear me. Here's the fun thing, here's the fun thing. You know, the little girl, the little girl, she was four years old, and her older brother is ten, and the older brother would play dad from time to time, and she'd go in there, and she'd sneak him one, and she'd just run out for her life, and she'd jump in the bed and just lay in my arms like nothing happened. Because she knew if I can get to my father, the enemy don't have I wish I had somebody here. Yeah. The enemy don't have access to me. Are you hearing me? Because protection was with her dad. You've got to get this. And we have the same relationship with God. And here we are. The devil's on my back. Well, get in daddy's arms and guess what he's going to do? Come on, is this making sense? Protection, protection, protection. And, and I love this fact. Their favorite restaurant was Chick-fil-A. And when they went to Chick-fil-A, it was never how much money they had. <laughs> Jeremiah has yet to say to me, or Israel, Grandpa, I can't afford Chick-fil-A, so we shouldn't be going there. He just said, let's go to Chick-fil-A. And they weren't concerned about how it was going to get paid. Are you with me? Because that was not their issue. Their issue was just to eat. And they knew when they got hungry, gra I wish I had somebody here. grandpa's job was to feed them. Does that make sense? Because they're identified with Christ. Their sons, their ears. And here's what scripture says in Matthew, right? Look at the birds. They don't toil. They don't sow. They don't reap. But your heavenly father takes care of them. But, and don't you know how much more he will take care of you and take care of me? And look at us image bearers identified with Christ. Worrying about bills. Worrying about tomorrow. Worrying about provision. Worrying about all that stuff. Leave it in the hands of the Father. He doesn't call you and say, you know, how much you have. He says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is mine and the fullness of it, the world and everyone who dwells in it. And if my daddy is rich in houses and land, guess what I'm worried about? Nothing because he's got it in control. Are you hearing me? I'm a child. And then I share in his power. Oh my gosh, that one messes us up. That one messes us up. Because lock into this. We think we have to do it. I mess around. I messed around last year when I was in Africa. Um, we bought some slingshots because we saw Africans playing with inch slingshot and we wanted some slingshots. Amen? So we snuck them. Amen. Yeah. I have to say that soft so it doesn't go on the airways. Yeah. And, and so my grandkids were sitting on the porch, and, and I'm shooting slingshots, showing them how to do it, and showing them how to pull it, right? And then little Jeremiah comes, and here's what he says to me. Grandpa, it's too hard. I can't pull it. I said, don't worry about it, baby. I got you. I stood behind him. I said, you hold this part. I put my hand on that part, and I reached across his shoulder, and I had... And I pulled, and he was like, wow, Grandpa, it's not that. I didn't know it was that easy because he didn't realize his strength was in me. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and the harder I pulled, the stronger he felt. Matter of fact, he was making faces like he was, like he was pulling that thing. And the whole time, he wasn't pulling nothing. It, I wish I had some. It was Grandpa doing all the work. And here's what Paul says, I can do all. Through Christ, who does what? Strengthens me. Quit pulling on your own. 
identity. Identity. I'm identified with Christ. And I've been failing because I've been trying to do all the work. Joint heirs. This is good news. This is good news. This is good news. To know that I'm in Christ and he has access to all this stuff. Let me say this second thing because I'm almost out of time and I didn't want to be up here. Look at the second verse. Go back to 1 John. Let me just share the second verse. Then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wrap this up. Look at this. Is this exciting, guys? Verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, Lord Jesus, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. How? As he is pure. A couple of more things that I'm done. Here's what I want you to understand. There's a present aspect, and there's also a future aspect of my identity. So here's what the second one says. When identifying Christ, I can enjoy the benefit of being in God's family, right? So here's, here's what Matthew 6 and 10 says. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? How? So, so here, here's the present tense. I don't have to wait. This is going to mess you up until I get to heaven to enjoy the full benefits of my identity, I can start enjoying it. Right, yeah. The reason a lot of us are not enjoying it right now, because we miss that piece that I just did on sonship, and we don't know what that's all about, and we think we need to do it. God's design, let me start on God's design, is not that you wait till you get to heaven to enjoy heaven, you can enjoy it now. Let me connect this theologically. This is the importance of the dichotomy and the unity thing, right? Jesus came and walked the earth, lived a sinless life, didn't worry about nothing. And then here's what he says to me, and here's what he said to you. See, I just did it. You can do it too. We don't like that part. I'm not Jesus. Well, who's in you? Does this make sense? And we can have abundant life now as it is in heaven, so it should be in life. So here's what John 10 10 says, right? I am come that you might have what? Life, and that you might have it how? The problem with that statement is the prosperity teachers have taken that statement and fool us into thinking abundant life means we must have fancy cars and nice homes and big bank account and never get sick and all that good stuff. Listen to me. Life is going to happen. Abundant life has nothing to do with what you possess in the here and now. You got to hear me say that. Abundant life has everything to do with the fact that Christ resides in you and you are a child of the king And there is no demon on hell can prevent you from realizing what God has in store for you. We can enjoy life now. Look at Jesus. I can't help but keep repeating that. Walk the face of the earth. You never once hear him complaining about, man, I'm broke. Man, I'm hungry. Man, I'm this. His heavenly father took care of him. And the same is true for you. And the same is true for me. Repeat after me. Say, self, I can enjoy life now. Look at the second thing right now. Let me go here. Um, The future aspect of identity means my hope now, listen to me, my hope is not in the things of the world. It's in the things to come. Here's what John says. Do not love the world, neither the things of the world. Okay. Now let me pause here for a parenthetic because when it says things of the world, don't confuse things of the world with People of the world. Because here's what it says in John 3.16. He so loved the world, meaning the people of the world, that he gave his only son. I have to love people, but I don't have to like their sins. But I got to love people. But here's the other thing. I don't allow the things of the world to become my God. Oh, I wish I had somebody here. Right? So I can enjoy life now, but my hope then is in the statement, this ain't it. 
as good and as comfortable as this may feel, this is not it. I can enjoy heaven on earth, but man, I can't wait to get to heaven. Now lock into this, and I'm done. Lock into this. Let me make this statement. Most of us view Jesus on earth, and we said, man, what great things he did, what power he had, how mighty he was, how wonderful he was, how all that stuff. Listen to this crazy statement. If you think the things Jesus did while he was on earth was something, imagine how powerful he is when he went back home to heaven. <laughs> I like this quote. Here's a quote by um, Charles Wesley. And if our fellowship below in Jesus be so sweet, what heights of rapture shall we know when round his throne we meet? It's old school stuff. If you think Jesus is sweet now, we have no idea what streets of gold are. We have no idea what walls made of jasper is. We have no idea what no more sickness means. Come on. We have no idea what no more heartache means. Come on. Y'all not hear me. You have no idea what no more suffering means. Come on. If you think this is good now, wait, oh, Jesus, wait until we get into the presence of God. And that's the hope. We can enjoy God now. But here, and we sing songs every day with Jesus. It's sweeter than the day before. But wait till we get to the presence of God when we are glorified and we get to enjoy him in the fullness of his glory. <laughs> I can appreciate the song, right? It says, when we all get to heaven, what a time of rejoicing. <laughs> That, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, y'all too young. Y'all just y'all y'all ain't been saved long enough to know about none of these stuff. Come on now. When we all see Jesus, we're gonna sing. And yeah, yeah. Some of y'all know it. Come on, some of y'all know it. I can't wait. But in the meantime, I have work to do. And here's how I begin, right? Here's how I begin with that subjunctive. We should be called children of God. Meaning, there's a whole lot of people who don't know who their identity is. I was perusing Facebook the other day, and I saw Pastor Vernon done preach the whole message. <laughs> A whole message on identity. That's what we all should be doing. We should make it difficult for anyone to go to hell from Aurora or Denver because we know who we are. Come on, y'all, because we know who we are. The only reason I don't share my faith is because I'm insecure in my identity. But if I know what Jesus did for me, oh, y'all not hearing me. Come on, y'all. If I know where he brought me from, if I know what he's done in my life, I don't care if you're my boss, my coworker. I don't care what your relationship is. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You not hear me. My job is to become contagious and cause me, the image in me, to rub off on you such that you say, man, what is that in you? And I can say it's the power of Jesus. But, but because the church is uncertain of their identity, we have become silent. Time to talk. Time to talk. Anybody in here know who they are? Come on, do you know who you are? We have, we have work to do. We have work to do. Here's how I want to end this. And Pastor Vernon, come on. Here's how I want to end this. If you're here and you have not yet said yes to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I want to pause. I want to take a moment to make sure that you don't leave here the same way you came. Now hear me out. If you're here, and man, you're unsure, you don't even know, I want to go as far as to say, don't risk it. Do not take the risk of leaving here the same way you came. I have nothing to lose but to say, God, I want to be called a child of God. I want to be called a son and a daughter of God. 
I want to know for sure that I know that I know that I know who I am. Don't make the assumption that because I've been in church all my life that by default I know him. No. Know who you are. Know who you are. Know who you are. God came for that purpose. For God so loved the world, it says he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. Everyone's going to live to get forever. It just depends on where we're going to live. My choice is to be with God. I want to be in the family of God. And if you're here and you haven't said yes to God, I want to invite you to come and allow God to be God. Come on, stand to your feet this morning.